Right, greetings, hello. So welcome back to the Philosophy Club here in Big Tet. Um, and we're meeting again, this time it's uh, Saturday, the um, just gone the new year. So we're the 7th of January now. And our last meeting was on New Year's Day, in fact, I think, or New Year's Eve. Um, but anyway, we're here for the um, first meeting of this new year, 2023, which is, let's hope it's going to be a year of more peace. The, the whole point of doing these talks, having these classes, is, is to advance peace through inter-philosophical understanding, inter-religious understanding. My, my analysis of the world problems at the moment, um, <clears throat> in terms of human conflict and so on, is, is that people are afraid of each other's belief systems, you know, Muslims are afraid of the Jews, Jews are afraid of the Muslims, different people are afraid of the Christians, different groups within Christianity are afraid of each other, Protestants are afraid of Catholics, Catholics are afraid of Gnostics, um, and so on, you know, and, and so what I'm trying to do with these series of talks is calm everyone down, get everyone to a place of, ah, oh, I didn't know that about your belief system, well that's interesting. I'd like to find out more about that, so that we transform our hatred, and our, which grows out of fear, into a curiosity, which grows out of love and friendship. So that we think, oh, that's interesting, I didn't know they believed that, let me find out about it. So we begin to do scholarship instead of bombing. Um, <clears throat> and we've just had the Orthodox Christmas, which is called Epiphany, yesterday, the 6th of January is Epiphany in the Christian tradition, and it represents the, the time when the three wise men, or magi, came from the east to see the baby Jesus, bringing frankincense, gold, and myrrh, and it's recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, which we've looked at. Um, and it's fascinating text, you know, what on earth are these wise men from the east doing coming, magi? Um, and there are different interpretations. In, in the Gaelic New Testament, in the Irish text, I have a copy of the Irish Bible over there, it says three Druids come to see baby Jesus. And the reason is that the word Druid in Irish Gaelic is simply the translation of Magi, which is the Persian priest from Zoroastrian religion, um, who were known as the Magi, or, and the, a single one is a Magus. A Magi is, is plural. Magus is one of them. And it just and, and then that came into English as the word magician. We use the word magus to mean someone that's very wise and can do white magic. We use the word magician to mean someone that it's got a dual function. It means either someone that can make rabbits come out of hats, or um, Crowley, who we looked at last week, added a K, meaning someone that does sort of esoteric uh, ritual, high magic as it's called. And there's a whole tradition of that in, in Europe and in other cultures as well. Taoists, um, people from India and so on. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, these three magicians, or Magi or Druids, come to see baby Jesus. Now, different people interpret it differently, but one interpretation is that's the wisdom of all the ages coming to salute the incarnation of the Logos. Um, you know, the... the um, the Qutub, to use the Sufi terminology, the, the spiritual peer or anchor point. And the Sufis say that at any one point on the earth, there is a Qutub, there is someone that holds the energy um, for all of us. Um, it's a you know metaphysical, the pole, as it were. Um, <clears throat> and so... So that, that office descended upon that little child born in Bethlehem. Um, and we know what happened in you know, the tragedy of his, his death. But then the story of Christianity is that that wasn't the end. Um, and he lived on, came back, he's still alive. Uh, the spirit of love was not defeated by death. Anyway, I just want to start my talk with a little bit of epiphany news. Because in Russia and... Um, the Eastern Orthodox world, Christianity in its Eastern form, uh, that yesterday was Christmas Day, so today is like Boxing Day for them. And I know, um, and 
the war in Ukraine, which has really been worrying me and really annoying me, because um, it's so pointless and ridiculous, um, is still dragging on. But Putin, who has got some sort of residual kind of orthodox Christian faith, I mean, very twisted form of it to think that invading um, Ukraine is a good idea, but nevertheless he has got some. And he went to the service yesterday in the Kremlin for Easter, uh, sorry, for Christmas in, in the Orthodox calendar. But I noted that he went to a service absolutely alone, whereas the mass of everyone else in Moscow, all his cronies, they all went to another cathedral. He did it deliberately. I'm not sure if he, he was afraid. He thought somebody might assassinate him. Slightly weird, this, to go to a, a solitary. I don't even know if there are any priests there, or was he just sitting alone in splendour in one cathedral, and then all his henchmen were in another one. I've read that. Uh, I think it must be true. I saw it in sort of like a news bulletin. But anyway, I wrote to Putin yesterday, um, and I'm going to go public with this. I'm going to you know, put the text of that letter is now, it's going to be public. Um, and I don't know if it will get through to him. I sent it via the Russian ambassador to France in Paris, which is the centre of diplomacy around the world. So they ought to pass it on. I wrote urgent. It was in English and Russian. And what I said to him is I first of all wished him happy Christmas, you know, happy epiphany, because he's a Christian. And I said... Thank you very much for your truce, because he declared a truce on the front line between... No Russians are supposed to fire any more missiles for a 36-hour period, which is just coming to an end. And I wrote and I said, thank you for that truce, um, <clears throat> but I want to make a suggestion that you extend it for another year. You know, a, a, a day is not enough, a day truce. These poor Ukrainians, and indeed the Russian troops, they need a whole year to recover from this trauma. So I told him, like, extend it for a year. Thank you very much. And also I gave him some advice. Um, merely speaking as a philosopher, if you want a druid, um, I recommended that for, for the next year he goes on retreat, personally. He steps down as president of Russia. He resi resigns his official titles and goes on retreat to a little island in Lake Ladoga, which is the biggest lake in Russia, not far from St. Petersburg, where there's a huge monastery um, dedicated to the Virgin. It's a very famous monastery in Russian history. Um, and he likes to go there. I've read that he, uh, that's where he likes to go on retreat when he wants to get away from the Kremlin and the pressures of life. So I said, Putin, step down from power and go to your monastery for a whole year, please. And just think about what you've done to the to Ukraine and to the world, you know, how Christian it is. And I quoted, of course, the Gospel of Matthew and Mark, where Jesus said, like, what is the use? How does it profit a man if you gain the whole world, but you lose your own soul? It's one of the best sayings of Christ. So Putin could, you know, fire more and more bombs at Ukraine and eventually slaughter every single Ukrainian he could. He could, you know, use nuclear weapons. I mean, obviously he couldn't because it would lead to an escalation that's incalculably horrendous to contemplate. But, I mean, if he was completely and utterly deranged, he could. But, he, so he could gain the whole world, you know, like blow it up. I mean, the world would be a smoking ruin. But he'd lose his own soul in doing that. Um, and what Christ said, look, what's the point of that? You know, don't go for outer mastery. Don't go for outer power. Go for inner self-knowledge, inner, inner power, wisdom, um, you know, um, esoteric knowledge. Um, and so that was my advice to Putin. You know, I think Putin sort of wavers. He's, he, he knows somehow deep down that spirituality is, is much more important than outer secular power. But he's not, he hasn't allowed himself to be honest about that to the system that surrounds him. He still thinks he's an old KGB officer who has to support the system, whatever it says and whatever it does. He was trained like that. Well, time to stop that, Mr. Putin. That's what I said in my letter. Um, you know, and, and go on a year's retreat. And meanwhile, appoint someone as your, your successor from a, a more holistic, universalist, indeed Tolstoyan Russian tradition. Someone that can repair this damage that's happened for this year. 
you know, that's the final death throw of Stalinism. That's the final death throw of all the nastiness of Stalinism and the lies. And indeed, the Bolshevik um, revolution, which was based on lies and anti-religiousness and, and cruelty. So anyway, I, I, only ha I have a duty to tell the truth to people in power, so I wrote the letter. We'll see. If you read on the news tomorrow that he's, he's going on retreat for a year to a monastic centre in then you'll know where it came from. I sincerely pray that he gets the letter and, and it, you know, triggers a, a conscience like St Paul. Um, I don't believe anyone is completely beyond reach of conscience. I think that was the point of, um, you know, Dostoevsky's work, another great Russian existentialist. So anyway, we'll see. I just wanted to start with that. And to me, that's, it's a test of our religiosity as a planet whether we can still heed that call to find wisdom instead of outer power and violence. Um, we'll see what happens, okay? Right. <clears throat> um, so what we're doing today, we're going to finish off, we've only got a tiny bit left of the new religious movements that we've been looking at in the last few sessions. Um, and we looked at... Um, we looked at quite a few last week. We looked at um, Radhaswami, Thelema, the uh, esoteric goddess worship, as I call the sort of California hippie movement, which rippled out. And then, um, and was it very much into psychedelics and so on. And then it blended into the New Age, which is box 110. We looked at that. I didn't mention one figure involved with the New Age that influenced me, which was a man called Sir George Trevelyan, an English... Um, Cornish esoteric polymath who was um, he was the adult educator at a thing called the Recon College which was close to um, where I trained as a religious studies teacher in Shropshire it's a beautiful part of western England close to Wales and Trevelyan worked there for 20 years running pioneering adult education classes in spirituality which I kind of <coughs> I did as well, but I was teaching around London. Um, and then he founded this thing called the Recon Trust, did old Sir George. And he, this was in the 80s, he got speakers in to give conferences and, you know, some of the leading thinkers of the New Age, as it were, came and spoke. Um, one of the features of the New Age thinking is that we, we try to understand both the scientific and the spiritual side of, of things. It's not just about religion, it's about science as well. Hence the periodic table includes science as well as religions. Um, George was a great man in his own way. He was not particularly... I mean, he was given a knighthood um, by the Queen um, for his services to education, I believe. He was a relative of um, Trevelyan, the great historian. And... Um, yeah, he, he was a great net networker, and he used the term New Age. He said that we are, we are pioneers here, trying to find a new way through um, the chaos of, of the wars. And he was a member of the Anthroposophical Society, set up by Rudolf Steiner. When I joined, he, um, he was my kind of mentor in that. Um, and he was influenced by some of the anthroposophists, um, a man called Walter Johannes Stein, who was another, I think, Austrian intellectual who wrote a book about karma and history and influenced by Steiner. I was doing my history degree around that time at the University of London. And what really interests me about history is if reincarnation is true, then, which it seems to be, I mean, the bulk of these traditions say there's something, some kind of reincarnation, that the individual soul has many lives and gradually, you know, hopefully on an upward spiral, um, gets more and more enlightened. Well then, does that mean that figures in history, you know, are now still walking the earth? And how can you tell? Um, so that, that's, that's something that's always intri intrigued me as a historian. And is there any way to be scientific about that? Um, I'm a member of the Scientific and Medical Network, which is another very interesting like research group that's asking those questions. And we just heard a talk recently by an American woman who's just written a book. She's channeled the book 
um, of famous intellectuals who are now dead. <clears throat> and through her medium guides and so on, she, she claims that she's had an update. Where's Goethe now? Which part of heaven is Goethe in, the great German intellectual? Which part is Jung in? And so on and so on. And <clears throat> now I don't know if it's true or not. I'm not sure how we could establish criteria of evaluation. I mean, Alice Bailey talks about you know, this sort of thing. Well, how can we evaluate if what she says is accurate? How can we evaluate if what this channeler in America says is accurate or not? Um, <clears throat> I mean, Edgar Casey is another of these New Age kind of channelers who, but he was saying stuff that's quite different to, say, Steiner, to, um, you know, some of the others. And what I proposed in my as part of my PhD research, is that we need a new criteria for what I call transpersonal history, so that we can establish methodically what are the laws of karma, what are the laws that govern incarnation and reincarnation, what, you know, how bad do you have to be to have a sort of hell-type experience, and how good do you have to be to have a kind of heaven experience, and what are they like, and... Um, yeah, who decides what happens? Do you see a jury? Well, well, who 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 appoints the jury? You know, um, I mean, what, and what happens to really thoroughly evil bad people like Hitler and Stalin and Pol Pot and people? Um, where do they go for their re-education? Um, <clears throat> you know, myriads of questions. Anyway, Trevelyan was was someone that sparked a lot of that interest in me, and I met him many times attended many of his talks. Okay, that's um, that's the New Age one. We'll finish there, 110. Oh, and William Bloom is another who people may have heard of. He did a PhD at um, the London School of Economics, the University of London, where I partly trained as a historian. William wrote on, on group psychology and international relations for his PhD. And he's gone on to become one of the most important kind of New Age thinkers in Britain. Um, and he attended a conference I organised back in 91 for at Prinash Abbey, the spiritual elders and, and representatives of different faiths. Um, you know, I've, we've crossed paths many times. Um, I wish he'd carried on with his PhD research, actually. He, he's gone in, he then got into more like talking to fairies and how to, me how to meditate. And, um, you know, that's all brilliant and really interesting. But I would, I would love it if William would also come back and, and give some thinking as to how academia can, can, can redeem the solidity of the criteria that, that divide our departments. So the anthropology department, the history department, the natural science departments. I think the university should become a much more um, permeable place where networking between different intellectual spheres is possible. And one of the tools for that is this periodic table. You know, that's why I've designed it. Um, I want to move on. So the next box is, is the last of the um, uh, new religious movements. And it's called simply Miscellaneous. Box 119. Now, the reason for that is because there are, you know, new, new religions are all bubbling up all the time. And so... One has to include quite a lot of stuff in, in miscellaneous that there wasn't space to fit in the other ones. And in this I include things like The Course in Miracles, which is another channeled work by a woman called Helen Schuchman, which many people swear by, um, and um, including, um, well, many quite well-known people, including the woman that stood for President of the US, um, a woman of great integrity in, in America, um, Helen Schuchman was an um, interesting woman. She was a medical doctor at Columbia, and she, but then she started receiving this sort of intuitive voice hearing, and her husband wrote it down, and um, over about ten or fifteen year period, and then it was published anonymously. She didn't want any credit, um, and it's it's a guide to how to do miracles. That's how this text is presented. It's called A Course in Miracles. How to, how to modify your, your sense of self so that miracles can happen um, would be a way of talking about it. Um, another person is Manly P. Hall, 
who is a, an amazing esoteric polymath who founded a center for philosophical research in Los Angeles in the 30s. Um, and uh, I've, you know, studied his works for a long time. Um, and recently they needed an executive director and I even applied for the post in Los Angeles. Thought that would be quite fun, but they appointed a local chap. Um, and a lot of people connected with Hollywood, and obviously Los Angeles is a bubbling community for the arts and film and media, and they often pop into this uh, esoteric philosophical research centre, which has a huge library of esoteric work. Manly Palmer Hall was Canadian by birth, but he ended up in America. He was a Freemason and um, an explorer of, of everything that we've been talking about in this course. He... His book, um, The Secret Teachings of All the Ages, is still one of the best kind of introductions to this. Um, and he has a particular interest um, as a Freemason in the work of Sir Francis Bacon, his links to Shakespeare, and that whole Tudor miracle connected with John Dee and others, which, of course, I've studied as well, coming from that culture. So I think Manly Palmer Hall is a great thinker, um, and I hope that, you know, that place flourishes for a long time. Uh, others would include Jane Roberts in this miscellaneous section, um, who channeled this material called the Seth material. She claimed to be in contact telepathically with this ancient wisdom teacher and produced these amazing um, texts which people study um, <clears throat> and which talk about the history of the universe, the nature of the human soul, and discusses questions like reincarnation and so on. Um, and the American woman that I was talking about, who's just done this publication contacting the afterlives of famous people, she is an expert with her husband in the Seth material. They've written learned studies of it. And people that study new religious movements do. They're very interested. Another figure would be Fritjof Capra, who's more on the scientific wing. He wrote a famous book called The Tower of Physics, arguing that modern physics, quantum theory, and Taoism, and Eastern religions are actually, like, seem to be saying the same thing. So isn't it time to have a mature conversation? And not just dismiss esoteric philosophy, like a certain arrogant generation attached to the Vienna positivist school, I think in the 20s and, and earlier did. They said everything that's non-material doesn't exist and therefore there's no point even discussing it. That, that's where Wittgenstein came from um, and it's very dismissive whereas and, and it infected many scientists who, who arrogantly thought well we're doing real science they're doing nonsense. But unfortunately the, those so-called real sciences have created nuclear weapons, have created biological weapons, have created global warming and a technology gone mad, you know. There's no ethics in science. So I, I'm, you know, I'm in a sort of permanent state of rebellion against the Vienna positivists and, um, you know, the Wittgensteinians who say, no, banish all metaphysics. Well, thank God for Fritjof Capra, who said, no, we're going to do metaphysics and science together. And he's been, you know, bless him, doing that for a long time. Um... <clears throat> Yeah, let's mention Carlos Castaneda as part of this new religious movement. Certainly in my generation, we all read this amazing anthropologist from California who went to Mexico and met this shaman called Don Juan. And I remember reading those books back in the, I think, early 70s. And, you know, it was really interesting to find, because he talks about how Don Juan could, was essentially a magician, and was producing very strange phenomena. And as an anthropologist, he thought he had to document this. Um, Don Juan was also introducing him to the, the judicious use of psychedelics. So that community he came from used um, peyote and other sacred things that would create these altered states of consciousness. Now that's what shamans have been doing since the beginning of time. In a sense, the new religious movement, paradoxically, like your Ouroboros, is going right back to the beginning. If you read Graham Hancock's book, and, and I think Graham Hancock is another of these kind of New Age detectives, if you want. He's just had a big series on um, 
Netflix. <clears throat> in his book Supernatural, Meetings with <clears throat> the Ancient Wisdom Teachers of Humanity, he talks about how <clears throat> he's personally gone off exploring psychedelics with shamans. And he describes very honestly the kinds of experiences he's had. And then he says that maybe this explains cave art, and maybe it explains the hominid explosion of about 50,000 BC. Why did our ancestors suddenly start painting weird things on cave walls, both in southern Africa and in France? They're figures, but they're all slightly distorted, and they're semi-animal, and they blend with geometrical patterns and shapes. They're not just straightforward, like, photographic pictures. He says <clears throat> he, they seem to be painting vision pictures that they've encountered during their trances and their psychedelic quests. <coughs> and it is very possible that that is the case. In other words, that would explain the beginning of art. Um, <clears throat> and that's kind of what, um, what these people are saying. <coughs> and it explains Don Juan's importance um, as a thinker. There are many others. I'm just going to say the names because um, if, if you want uh, details on any of them, you know, look them up, contact me. Edgar Case, Ruth Montgomery, Harry Edwards, a spiritual healer, <coughs> Arthur Kersler, Matthew Manning, Ida Rolf, um, Paul Devereaux, John Michelle, um, I'd even include um, people like Henry Sidgwick and W.H. Myers who were pioneering parapsychologists, Lord Rayleigh, Arthur Balfour, Bubba Free John, <coughs> um, William James who, who, who gave Gifford lectures on the varieties of religious experience. Um, back at the turn of the 19th, 20th centuries. William Crookes, Grace Cook, obviously Jung is part of this tradition, um, Frank Podmore, Henry Bergson, many Tibetans, including Lama Gangchen, they were kind of New Age Tibetans, if you want. Um, Lorna Byrne, an Irish mystic, Doreen Virtue, Bly Bond, who, who did some in, in, important work, um, <coughs> Stephen Turoff, J.B. Ryan, and so on. You know, there's, there's a whole list. These are what I call the miscellaneous, because you can't give them all a box, <laughs> or the table would be too big. So I stuck them all in miscellaneous new religious movements. So I'd also include people that study geomancy and earth energies, who talk about the whole planet is a kind of grid of consciousness, and that if you're a psychic medium, you can plug into that. Um, <clears throat> and that goes back to ancient China, the Taoist tradition. But it's also alive and well now. Um, I'd include also people that do psychic archaeology, who can pick up an object and kind of tell you who owned it 2,000 years ago. I mean, that's very interesting. As a historian, I'd like more of that, and I'd like to cross-reference it and and see if we can... You know, if it's true, if it's if it's genuine, or is it just them fantasizing and making stuff up? I suspend judgment. Just obviously, with all these boxes, I suspend judgment. I'm an academic. I'm not a. I, I'm enthusiastic about the possibility that, that they're all true in some way. I'd like to find out the golden nugget of truth in them all. Um, psychic archaeology is very fascinating. Also, remote viewing, which is a sort of, <clears throat> in a sense, psychic archaeology is like doing remote viewing, taking it back in time. Remote viewing is when <clears throat> you go into a trance and you can see something thousands of miles away. Apparently, people can do this and they train for it. And um, you know, it used to be called clairvoyance, but people that are trying to be scientific about it call it remote viewing. And they've been tested empirically and they get stuff right. <clears throat> you know, if somebody was remote viewing this village at the moment, they'd see, ah, oh, this house, it's in the high street, it's got a church there, and, you know, they could describe it. Now, if they're sitting in an office in Berkeley, in California, how could they do that? I mean, okay, now you can go on the internet and look it up, but um, 
there'd be ways of testing its veracity. And apparently it is a human skill. Now, how is that possible? Well, discuss, but one theory is that the individual mind, the, the mind of Thomas, or the mind of each individual, can, by silencing itself, by, by as it were, allowing the Thomas, the immediate ego, to subside, can then gravitate towards a higher realm of consciousness, a sort of world soul, which interfuses around the whole planet. The anima mundi, uh, Jung called it, the soul of the world. And, and then once you get access to the anima mundi, then you can, you can see the whole thing simultaneously. And this is a state you can reach in deep meditation. Um, <clears throat> and if that's true, and I suspect this is what these kind of psychics do, I think then, then it's not difficult to say, look, what's happening over there in Batet? Can you give me a view of it, please? And the world soul will then allow yourself, the ego of that viewer, to have a glimpse of that. Um, you know, that's that I'm merely speaking as a philosopher trying to explain how they do it. Um, <clears throat> it's possible. And in fact, a, a famous American philosopher did write a book. Um, well, there have been several attempts by philosophers to make sense of this. Um, one of, one of the most interesting American philosophers who was, who was looking into this was, um, has recently died, who was an activist for the truth about 9-11 to come out. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, he's just died, but he'd, he wrote some books about parapsychology as a philosopher, which are very valuable. Um, so, <clears throat> and there are obviously text, channel materials, that kind of thing, um, some of these people also like to consult with angels. Maybe angels is a word for beings of higher consciousness that are more in touch with the world soul, the anima mundi, and therefore can channel profound knowledge. Maybe that's what happened to the Virgin Mary when she was told by an angel that she's going to give birth to the Messiah. I mean, that's quite a thing to happen to a 15-year-old girl albeit someone raised in the temple in Jerusalem, someone from a very religious background, you know, and then to encounter a consciousness that told her that, some kind of inner knowing, you know, we don't know. <clears throat> and then if you're Muhammad and you encounter an angel who tells you that you, you're bringing a new message for all humanity, for us to change our ways and, and, and become totally at peace and surrender to God, well, that was quite an experience for him as well. So, what are these angels? They seem to be windows onto the world's soul. Um, <clears throat> there's also another very interesting text um, of people in Hungary, um, a particular woman and a group contacting angelic consciousnesses. One of them was Jewish. During the war, when the Jews were being hounded up and persecuted, they were hiding in Hungary and Budapest and they did this channeling with this angel and these books were finally published in French and now translated into English. That's kind of doing angel work under duress, you know, in secret during the war, asking for guidance from the angelic realm, like what can we do to help whilst all the madness of the war was going on. Um, there's cases of John Dee doing similar stuff. He used to contact angels. Um, in, in Tudor Britain. Um, <clears throat> and there are people that do that. So, so that's a whole thing of New Age, um, you know, and new religious um, tradition that, that would train us to be able to contact angelic consciousness. Um, also in this is, is the whole field of parapsychology, which I've talked about, which um, is still going, going strong. You know, they're developing tests and and so on. And also the phenomena known as crop circles. Those are very interesting and, and it's kind of like a new religious movement in Wiltshire in England. It, mainly it's in Britain, but 